story one of jim the story of a backwoods police dog and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales jim the story of a backwoods police dog and other stories by charles roberts story one jim the story of a backwoods police dog part one how woolly billy came to brine's rip one jim's mother was a big cross-bred bitch half newfoundland and half bloodhound belonging to black saunders one of the hands at the brine's rip mills as the mills were always busy saunders was always busy and it was no place for a dog to be around among the screeching saws the thumping wet logs and the spurting sawdust so the big bitch with fiery energy thrilling her veins and sinews and the restraint of a master's hand seldom exercised upon her practically ran wild hunting on her own account in the deep wilderness which surrounded brine's rip settlement she became a deadly menace to every wild thing less formidable than a bear or a bull moose till at last in the early prime of her adventurous career she was shot by an angry game warden for her depredations among the deer and the young caribou jim's father was a splendid and pedigreed specimen of the old english sheepdog from a litter of puppies of this uncommon parentage tug blackstock the deputy sheriff of nipsiwaska county chose out the one that seemed to him the likeliest paid black saunders a sovereign for him and named him jim to tug blackstock for some unfathomed reason the name of jim stood for self-contained efficiency it was efficiency in chief that tug blackstock as deputy sheriff was after he had been reading in a stray magazine with torn cover and much thumbed pages an account of the wonderful doings of the trained police dogs of paris the story had fired his imagination and excited his envy there was a lawless element in some of the outlying corners of nipsiwaska county with a larger element of yet more audacious lawlessness beyond the county line from which to recruit throughout the wide and mostly wilderness expanse of nipsiwaska county the responsibility for law and order rested almost solely upon the shoulders of tug blackstock his chief the sheriff a prosperous shopkeeper who owed his appointment to his political pull knew little and thought less of the duties of his office as soon as jim was old enough to have an interest beyond his breakfast and the worrying of his rag doll tug blackstock set about his training it was a matter that could not be hurried tug had much work to do and jim as behooved a growing puppy had a deal of play to get through in the course of each twenty-four hours then so hard was the learning so easy alas the forgetting tug blackstock was kind to all creatures but timber thieves and other evil-doers of like kidney he was patient with the long patience of the forest but he had a will like the granite of old baldface jim was quick of wit willing to learn intent to please his master but it was hard for him to concentrate it was hard to keep his mind off cats and squirrels the worrying of old boots and other doggish frivolities hence at times some painful misunderstandings between teacher and pupil in the main however the education of jim progressed to a marvel they were a pair indeed to strike the most stolid imagination let alone the sensitive brooding watchful imagination of the backwoods tug blackstock was a tall spare figure of a man narrow of hip deep of chest with something of a stoop to his mighty shoulders and his head thrust forward as if in ceaseless scrutiny of the unseen his hair worn somewhat short and pushed straight back was faintly grizzled his face tanned and lean was markedly wide at the eyes with a big well-modelled nose a long obstinate jaw and a wide mouth whimsically uptwisted at one corner except on the trail and even then he usually carried a razor in his pack he was always clean-shaven just because he didn't like the curl of his beard his jacket shirt and trousers were of browny gray homespun of much the same hue as his soft slouch hat 
all as inconspicuous as possible but at his throat loosely knotted under his wide rolling shirt collar he wore usually an ample silk handkerchief of vivid green spattered with big yellow spots like dandelions in a young june meadow as for jim at first glance he might almost have been taken for a slim young black bear rather than a dog the shaggy coat bequeathed to him by his sheep-dog sire gave to his legs and to his hindquarters an appearance of massiveness that was almost clumsy but under this dense black fleece his lines were fine and clean-drawn as a bull terrier's the hair about his eyes grew so long and thick that if left to itself it would have seriously interfered with his vision this his master could not think of permitting so the riotous hair was trimmed down severely till jim's large sagacious eyes gazed out unimpeded from ferocious brush-like rims of stubby fur about half an inch in length Two for some ten miles above the long white furrowed face of brine's rip where blue forks brook flows in the main stream of the adonunsis is a succession of mad rapids and toothed ledges and treacherous channel-splitting shoals these ten miles are a trial of nerve and watercraft for the best canoeist on the river in the spring when the river was in freshet and the feed logs were racing battering and jamming the whole reach was such a death trap for the stream drivers that it had come to be known as dead man's run now in high summer when the stream was shrunken in its channel and the sunshine lay golden over the roaring creamy chutes and the dancing shallows the place looked less perilous but it was full of snares and hidden teeth it was no place for the canoeist however expert with the pole and paddle unless he knew how to read the water unerringly for many yards ahead it is this reading of the water this instantaneous solving of the hieroglyphics of foam and surge and swirl and glassy lunge that makes the skilled runner of the rapids a light birch-bark canoe with a man in the stern and a small child in the bow was approaching the head of the rapids which were hidden from the paddler's view by a high densely wooded bend of the shore the canoe leapt forward swiftly on the smooth quiet current under the strong drive of the paddle the paddler was a tall big-limbed man with fair hair fringing out under his tweed cap and a face burnt red rather than tanned by the weather he was dressed roughly but well and not as a woodsman and he had a subtle air of being foreign to the backwoods he knew how to handle his paddle however the prow of his craft keeping true though his strokes were slow and powerful the child who sat facing him on a cushion in the bow was a little boy of four or five years in a short scarlet jacket and blue knickers his fat bare legs were covered with fly bites and scratches his baby face of the tenderest cream and pink his round interested eyes as blue as periwinkle blossoms but the most conspicuous thing about him was his hair he was bareheaded his little cap lying in the bottom of the canoe among the luggage and the hair as white as tow stood out like a fleece all over his head enmeshing the sunlight in its silken tangle when the canoe shot round the bend the roar of the rapids smote suddenly upon the voyager's ears the child turned his bright head inquiringly but from his low place could see nothing to explain the noise his father however sitting up on the hinder bar of the canoe could see a menacing white line of tossing crests a flash in the sunlight stretching from shore to shore backing water vigorously to check his headway he stood up to get a better view and choose his way through the surge the stranger was master of his paddle but he had had no adequate experience in running rapids such light and unobstructed rips as he had gone through had merely sufficed to make him regard lightly the menace confronting him he had heard of the perils of dead man's run but that of course meant in time of freshet when even the mildest streams are liable to go mad and run amuck this was the season of dead low water and it was hard for him to imagine there could be anything really to fear from this lively but shrunken stream 
he was strong clear-eyed steady of nerve and he anticipated no great trouble in getting through as the light craft dipped into the turmoil jumping as if buffeted from below and the wave-tops slapped in on either side of the bow the little lad gave a cry of fear sit tight boy don't be afraid said the father peering ahead with intent narrowed eyes and surging fiercely on his blade to avoid a boiling rock just below the first chute as he swept past in safety he laughed in triumph for the passage had been close and exciting and the conquest of a mad rapid is one of the thrilling things in life and worth going far for his laugh reassured the child who laughed also but cowered low in the canoe and stared over the gunwale with wide eyes of awe but already the canoe was darting down toward a line of black rocks smothered in foam the man paddled desperately to gain the other shore where there seemed to be a clear passage slanting sharply across the great current surging with short terrific strokes upon his sturdy maple blade his teeth set and his breath coming in grunts he was swept on downward sideways toward the rocks with appalling speed but he made the passage swept the bow round and raced through shaving the rock so narrowly that his heart paused and the sweat jumped out suddenly cold on his forehead immediately afterwards the current swept him to midstream just here the channel was straight and clear of rocks and though the rips were heavy the man had a few minutes respite with little to do but hold his course with a stab at the heart he realized now into what peril he had brought his baby eagerly he looked for a chance to land but on neither side could he make shore with any chance of escaping shipwreck a woodsman expert with the canoe pole might have managed it but the stranger had neither pole nor skill to handle one he was in the grip of the wild current and could only race on trusting to master each new emergency as it should hurl itself upon him presently the little one took alarm again at his father's stern-set mouth and preoccupied eyes the man had just time to shout once more don't be afraid son dad'll take care of you when the canoe was once more in a yelling chaos of chutes and ledges and now there was no respite unable to read the signs of the water he was full upon each new peril before he recognized it and only his great muscular strength and instant decision saved them again and again they barely by a hair's breadth slipped through the jaws of death and it seemed to the man that the gnashing ledges raved and yelled behind him at each miracle of escape then hissing wave crests cut themselves off and leapt over the racing gunwale till he feared the canoe would be swamped once they scraped so savagely that he thought the bottom was surely ripped from the canoe but still he won onward mile after roaring mile his will fighting doggedly to keep his eyesight from growing hopelessly confused with the hellish sliding dazzle and riot of waters but at last the fiend of the flood having played with its prey long enough laid bare its claws and struck the bow of the canoe in swerving from one foam curtained rock grounded heavily upon another in an instant the little craft was swung broadside on and hung there the waves piled upon her in a yelling pack she was smothered down and rolled over helplessly as they shot out into the torrent the man with a terrible cry sprang toward the bow striving to reach his son he succeeded in catching the little one with one hand by the back of the scarlet jacket the next moment he went under and the jacket came off over the child's head a whimsical cross-current dragged the little boy twenty feet off to one side and shot him into a shallow side channel when the man came to the surface again his eyes were shut his face stark white his legs and arms flung about aimlessly as weeds but fast in his unconscious grip he held the little red jacket the canoe its side stove in and full of water was hurrying off down the rapid amid a fleet of paddles cushions blankets boxes and bundles the body of the man heavy and inert and sprawling followed more slowly 
the waves rolled it over and trampled it down shouldered it up again and snatched it away viciously whenever it showed an inclination to hang itself up on some projecting ledge it was long since they had had such a victim on whom to glut their rancor the child meanwhile after being rolled through the laughing shallows of the side channel and playfully buffeted into a half-drowned unconsciousness was stranded on a sand spit some eight or ten yards from the right-hand shore there he lay half in the water half out of it the silken white floss of his hair all plastered down to his head the rippled current tugging at his scratched and bitten legs the unclouded sun shone down warmly upon his face slowly bringing back the rose to his baby lips and a small paper-blue butterfly hovered over his head for a few seconds as if puzzled to make out what kind of being he was the sand spit which had given the helpless little one refuge was close to the shore but separated from it by a deep and turbulent current a few minutes after the blue butterfly had flickered away across the foam a large black bear came noiselessly forth from the fir woods and down to the water's edge he gazed searchingly up and down the river to see if there were any other human creatures in sight then stretched his savage black muzzle out over the water toward the sand pit eyeing and sniffing at the little unconscious figure there in the sun he could not make out whether it was dead or only asleep in either case he wanted it he stepped into the foaming edge of the sluice and stood there whimpering with disappointed appetite daunted by the snaky vehemence of the current presently as the warmth of the flooding sun crept into his veins the child stirred and opened his blue eyes he sat up noticed he was sitting in the water crawled to a dry spot and snuggled down into the hot sand for a moment he was too dazed to realize where he was then as the life pulsed back into his veins he remembered how his father's hand had caught him by the jacket just as he was plunging into the awful waves now the jacket was gone his father was gone too daddy daddy he wailed and at the sound of that wailing cry so unmistakably the cry of a youngling for its parent the bear drew back discreetly behind a bush and glanced uneasily up and down the stream to see if the parent would come in answer to the appeal he had a wholesome respect for the grown-up man-creature of either sex and was ready to retire on the approach of one but no one came the child began to sob softly in a lonesome frightened suppressed way in a minute or two however he stopped this and rose to his feet and began repeating over and over the shrill wail of daddy 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 at the same time he peered about him in every direction almost hopefully as if he thought his father must be hiding somewhere near to jump out presently for a game of bo-peep with him his baby eyes were keen they did not find his father but they found the bear its great black head staring at him from behind a bush his cries stopped on the instant in the middle of a syllable frozen in his throat with terror he cowered down again upon the sand and stared speechless at the awful apparition the bear realizing that the little one's cries had brought no succor came out from his hiding confidently and down to the shore and straight out into the water till the current began to drag too savagely at its legs here it stopped grumbling and baffled the little one unable any longer to endure the dreadful sight backed to the extreme edge of the sand covered his face with his hands and fell to whimpering piteously an unceasing hopeless monotonous little cry as vague and inarticulate as the wind the bear convinced at length that the sluice just here was too strong for him to cross drew back to the shore reluctantly it moved slowly upstream some forty or fifty yards looking for a feasible crossing disappointed in this direction it then explored the water's edge for a little distance downstream but with a like result but it would not give up up and down up and down it continued to patrol the shore with hungry obstinacy 
and the piteous whimpering of the little figure that cowered with hidden face upon the sand-spit gradually died away that white fleece of silken locks dried in the sun and blown by the warm breeze stood out once more in its radiance on the lonely little slumbering head three tug blackstock sat on a log smoking and musing on the shore of that wide eddying pool full of slow whirls and spent foam clusters in which the tumbling riot of brine's rip came to a rest from the mills behind him screeched the untiring saws outstretched at feet lay jim indolently snapping at flies the men of the village were busy in the mills the women in their cottages the children in their schools and the stretch of rough shore gave tug blackstock the solitude which he loved down through the last race of the rapids came a canoe paddle and began revolving slowly in the eddies blackstock pointed it out to jim and sent him in after it the dog swam for it gaily grabbed it by the top so that it could trail at his side and brought it to his master's feet it was a good paddle of clean bird's-eye maple and malachite pattern and tug blackstock wondered who could have been so careless as to lose it carelessness is a vice regarded with small leniency in the backwoods a few minutes later down the rapids came wallowing a waterlogged birch canoe the other things which had started out with it the cushions and blankets and bundles had got themselves tangled in the rocks and left behind at sight of the wrecked canoe tug blackstock rose to his feet he began to suspect another of the tragedies of dead man's run but what riverman could come to grief in the run at this stage of the water blackstock turned to an old dugout which lay hauled up on the shore ran it down into the water and paddled out to salvage the wrecked canoe he towed it to shore emptied it and scrutinized it he thought he knew every canoe on the river but this one was a stranger to him it had evidently been brought across the portage from the east coast then he found burnt into the inside of the gunwale near the bow the letters j c m w the englishman he muttered he's let the canoe get away from him at the head of the run likely when he's gone ashore he'd never have tried to shoot the run alone and him with no experience of rapids but he was uneasy he decided that he would get his own canoe and pole up through the rapids just to satisfy himself tug blackstock's canoe a strong and swift federicton of polished canvas built on the lines of a racing birch was kept under cover in his woodshed at the end of the village street he shouldered it carrying it over his head with the mid bar across his shoulders and bore it down to the water's edge then he went back and fetched his two canoe poles and his paddles waving jim into the bow he was just about to push off when his narrowed eyes caught sight of something else rolling and threshing helplessly down the rapid only too well he saw what it was his face pale with concern he thrust the canoe violently up into the tail of the rapid just in time to catch the blindly sprawling shape before it could sink to the depths of the pool tenderly he lifted it out upon the shore it was battered almost out of recognition but he knew it poor devil poor devil he muttered sorrowfully he was a man all right but he didn't understand rapids for shucks then he noticed that in the dead man's right hand was clutched a tiny child's jacket he understood he saw the whole scene and he swore compassionately under his breath as he unloosed the rigid fingers alive or dead the little one must be found at once he called jim sharply and showed him the soaked red jacket jim sniffed at it but the wearer's scent was long ago soaked out of it he looked it over and pawed it wagging his tail doubtfully he could see it was a small child's jacket but what was he expected to do with it after a few moments tug blackstock patted the jacket vigorously and then waved his arm upstream go find him jim he ordered jim hanging upon each word and gesture comprehended instantly he was to find the owner of the little jacket a child somewhere up the river with a series of eager yelps which meant that he would do all that living dog could do he started up the shore on the full run 
by this time the mill whistles had blown the screaming of the saws had stopped the men powdered with yellow sawdust were streaming out from the wide doors they flocked down to the water in hurried words blackstock explained the situation then he stepped once more into his canoe snatched his long steel-shod pole and thrust his prow up into the wild current leaving the dead man to the care of the coroner and the village authorities before he had battled his way more than a few hundred yards upwards through the raging smother two more canoes with expert polers standing poised in them like statues had pushed out to follow him in his search the rest of the crowd picked up the body and bore it away reverently to the courtroom with sympathetic women weeping beside it racing along the open edge of the river where it was possible tearing fiercely through thicket and underbrush where rapids or rocks made the river's edge impassable the great black dog panted onwards with the sweat dripping from jaws and tongue whenever he was forced away from the river he would return to it every fifty yards or so and scan each rock shoal or sand spit with keen sagacious eyes he had been told to search the river that was the plain interpretation of the wet jacket and of tug blackstock's gesture so he wasted no time upon the woods and the undergrowth at last he caught sight of the little fluffy-headed figure huddled upon the sand spit far across the river he stopped stared intently and then burst into loud ecstatic barkings as an announcement that his search had been successful but the noise did not carry across the tumult of the ledge and the little one slept on exhausted by his terror and his grief it was not only the sleeping child that jim saw he saw the bear and his barking broke into shrill yelps of alarm and appeal he could not see that the sluice between the sandspit and the bank was an effective barrier and he was frantic with anxiety lest the bear should attack the little one before he could come to the rescue his experienced eye told him in a moment that the river was impassable for him at this point he dashed on upstream for another couple of hundred yards and then where a breadth of comparatively slack water beneath a long ledge extended more than halfway across he plunged in undaunted by the clamour and the jumping boiling foam swimming mightily he gained a point directly above the sand spit then fighting every inch of the way to get across the terrific draught of the main current he was swept downward at a tremendous speed but he had carried out his plan he gained the shallow side channel splashed down it and darted up the sand spit with a menacing growl at the bear across the sluice at the sound of that harsh growl close to his ears the little one woke up and raised his head seeing jim big and black and dripping he thought it was the bear with a piercing scream he once more hid his face in his hands rigid with horror puzzled at this reception jim fell to licking his hands and his ears extravagantly and whining and thrusting a coaxing wet nose under his arm at last the little fellow began to realize that these were not the actions of a foe timidly he lowered his hands from his face and looked around why there was the bear on the other side of the water tremendous and terrible but just where he had been this ever so long this creature that was making such a fuss over him was plainly a dog a kind good dog who was fond of little boys with a sigh of inexpressible relief his terror slipped from him he flung his arms about jim's shaggy neck and buried his face in the wet fur and jim his heart swelling with pride stood up and barked furiously across at the bear tug blackstock standing in the stern of his canoe plied his pole with renewed effort reaching the spit he strode forward snatched the child up in his arms and passed his great hand tenderly through that wonderful shock of whitey gold silken curls his eyes were moist but his voice was hearty and gay as if this meeting were the most ordinary thing in the world hello woolly billy he cried what are you doing here daddy left me here answered the child his lip beginning to quiver where's he gone to oh replied tug blackstock hurriedly your dad was called away rather sudden and he sent me and jim here to look after you till he gets back 
and we'll do it too woolly billy don't you fret my name's george harold manners watson explained the child politely but we'll just call you woolly billy for short said tug blackstock end of story one part one story one of jim the story of a backwoods police dog and other stories by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain story one part two the book agent and the buckskin belt one a big framed jaunty man with black side whiskers a long black frock coat and a square flat case of shiny black leather strapped upon his back stepped into the corner store at brimes rip mills he said hello boys hot day in a big voice that was intentionally hearty ran his bulging eyes appraisingly over every one present then took off his wide-brimmed felt hat and mopped his glistening forehead with a big red and white handkerchief receiving a more or less hospitable chorus of grunts and hellos in response he seated himself on a keg of nails removed the leather case from his back and asked for ginger beer which he drank noisily from the bottle name a biles said he at length introducing himself with a sweeping nod hot tramp in from cribs ridge thirsty you bet never drink nothing stronger than ginger pop or soft cider have a round of pop on me boys a one pop this is a yours mister a dozen more bottles please for these gentlemen he looked around the circle with an air at once assured and persuasive and the taciturn woodsman not wholly at ease under such sudden cordiality from a stranger but too polite to rebuff him muttered thank ye kindly or here's how as they threw back their heads and poured the weak stuff down their gaunt and hairy throats it was a slack time at brine's rip the mills having shut down that morning because the river was so low that there were no more logs running the shrieking saws being silent for a little there was nothing for the mill hands to do but loaf and smoke the hot air was heavily scented with the smell of fresh sawdust mixed with the strong honey perfume of the flowering buckwheat fields beyond the village the buzzing of flies in the windows of the store was like a fine arabesque of sound against the ceaseless muffled thunder of the rapids the dozen men gathered here at zeb smith's store which was in effect the village club found it hard to rouse themselves to a conversational effort in any way worthy the advances of the confident stranger they all smoked a little harder than usual and looked on with courteous but non-committal interest while he proceeded to unstrap his shiny black leather case in his stiff and sombre garb so unsuited to the backwoods trails the stranger had much the look of one of those itinerant preachers who sometimes busy themselves with the cure of souls in the remoter backwood settlements but his eye and his address were rather those of a shrewd and pushing commercial traveller tug blackstock the deputy sheriff of nipsiwaska county felt a vague antagonism toward him chiefly on the ground that his speech and bearing did not seem to consort with his habiliments he rather liked a man to look what he was or be what he looked and he did not like black side whiskers and long hair this antagonism however he felt to be unreasonable the man had evidently had a long and tiring tramp and was entitled to a somewhat friendlier reception than he was getting swinging his long legs against the counter on which he sat between a pile of printed calicoes and a box of bright pink fancy soap tug blackstock reached behind him and possessed himself of a box of long black cigars having selected one critically for himself he proffered the box to the stranger have a weed said he cordially they ain't half bad but the stranger waved the box aside with an air at once grand and gracious i never touch the weed thank you kindly just the same said he but i'm nothing agin it it goes agin my system that's all if it's all the same to you i take a bite of cheese and a cracker instead of the cigar sartin agreed blackstock jumping down to fetch the edibles from behind the counter like most of the regular customers he knew the store and its contents almost as well as zeb smith himself during the last few minutes an immense rough-haired black dog had been sniffing the stranger over with suspicious minuteness 
the stranger at first paid no attention whatever though it was an ordeal that many might have shrunk from at last seeming to notice the animal for the first time he recognized his presence by indifferently laying his hand upon his neck instead of instantly drawing off with a resentful growl after his manner with strangers the dog acknowledged the casual caress by a slight wag of the tail and then after a few moments turned away amicably and lay down if jim finds him all right thought blackstock to himself there can't be much wrong with him though i can't say i take to him myself and he weighed off a much bigger piece of cheese than he had at first intended to offer marking down his indebtedness on a slate which served the proprietor as a sort of day-book the stranger fell to devouring it with an eagerness which showed that his lunch must have been of the lightest you was sayin as how you'd just come up from cribs ridge put in a long-legged heavy-shouldered man who was sprawling on a cracker box behind the door he had short sandy hair rapidly thinning eyes of a cold gray set rather close together and a face that suggested a cross between a fox and a fish-hawk he was somewhat conspicuous among his fellows by the trimness of his dress his shirt being of dark blue flannel with a rolled-up collar and a scarlet knotted kerchief while the rest of the mill hands wore collarless shirts of gray homespun with no thought of neckerchiefs his trousers were of brown corduroy and were held up by a broad belt of white dressed buckskin elaborately decorated with navajo designs in black and red he stuck to this adornment tenaciously as a sort of inoffensive proclamation of the fact that he was not an ordinary backwoods mill hand but a wanderer one who had travelled far and tried his wits at many ventures in the wilder west right you are assented the stranger brushing some white cracker crumbs out of his black whiskers i was just a wonderin went on hawker giving a hitch to the elaborate belt and leaning forward a little to spit out through the doorway if you seed anything of jake sanderson on the road the stranger having his mouth full of cheese did not answer for a moment the boys are lookin for him rather anxious explained blackstock with a grin he brings the leetle fat roll that pays the wages here at the mill and it's due some time to-day i seen him at cribs ribs this mornin answered the stranger at last said he'd hurt his foot or sprained his knee or something and would have to come on a bit slow he'll be along some time to-night i guess didn't seem to me to have much wrong with him now nah, you can't have none of that cheese go away and lay down he added suddenly to the great black dog who had returned to his side and laid his head on the stranger's knee with a disappointed air the dog obeyed tain't often jim's so civil to a stranger muttered blackstock to himself a little boy in a scarlet jacket with round eyes of china blue and an immense mop of curly fluffy silky hair so palely flaxen as to be almost white came hopping and skipping into the store he was greeted with friendly grins while several voices drawled hello woolly billy he beamed cheerfully upon the whole company with a special gleam of intimate confidence for tug blackstock and the big black dog then he stepped up to the stranger's knee and stood staring with respectful admiration at those flowing jet-black side-whiskers the stranger in return looked with a cold curiosity at the child's singular hair neither children nor dogs had any particular appeal for him but that hair was certainly queer most an albino ain't he he suggested no he ain't replied tug blackstock curtly the dog detecting a note of resentment in his master's voice got up and stood beside the child and gazed about the circle with an air of anxious interrogation had any one been disagreeable to woolly billy and if so who but the little one was not the least rebuffed by the stranger's unresponsiveness what's that he inquired patting admiringly the stranger's shiny leather case the stranger grew cordial to him at once ah now you're talkin said he enthusiastically undoing the flap of the case it's a book sonny the greatest book the most interestin book the most useful book and next to the bible the most high-toned upliftin book that was ever written you can't read yet sonny but this book has the loveliest pictures you ever seen and the greatest lot of them for the money 
he drew reverently forth from the case a large fat volume bound sumptuously in embossed sky-blue imitation leather lavishly gilt and opened it upon his knees with a spacious gesture there he continued proudly it's called mother home and heaven ain't that a title for you don't it show you right off the kind of book it is with this book by you you don't need any other book in the house at all except maybe the almanac and the bible and this book has lots of the best bits of the bible in it scattered through among the receipts and things to keep at all wholesome and upliftin it'll tell you such useful things as how to get a cork out of a bottle without breaking the bottle when you haven't got a corkscrew or what to do when the baby's got croup and there ain't a doctor this side of tour de lac and it'll tell you how to live so as when things happen that no medicine and no doctors and no receipts not even such great receipts as these here ones and he slapped his hand on the counter can help you through such as when a tree falls on you or you trip and stumble onto the saws or get drawn down under half a mile of raft then you'll be ready to go right on aloft and no question asked you in the great white gate and it has poetry in it too real hard poetry such as'll take you back to the time when you was all white and innocent a sin at your mother's knee and make you wish you was like that now in fact boys this book i'm a-goin to show you with your kind permission is handier than a pocket in a shirt and at the same time the blessed fragrance of it is like a rose of sharon in the household it's in three styles of bindin all real handsome but i want to look at another picture now protested woolly billy i'm tired of this one of the angels saying their prayers his amazing shock of silver gold curls was bent intently over the book in the stranger's lap the woodsmen on the other hand kept on smoking with a far-off look as if they heard not a word of the fluent harangue they had a deep distrust and dread of this black-whiskered stranger now that he stood revealed as the man wanting to sell something the majority of them would not even glance in the direction of the gaudy book lest by doing so they should find themselves involved in some expensive and complicated obligation the stranger responded to woolly billy's appeal by shutting the book firmly there's lots more pictures prettier than that one sonny said he but you must ask your dad to buy it for you he won't regret it and he passed the volume on to hawker who having no dread of book agents began to turn over the leaves with a superior smile dad's gone ever so far away answered woolly billy sadly it's an awfully pretty book and he looked at tug blackstock appealingly look here mister drawled blackstock i don't take much stock myself in this kind of book and moreover not meanin no offence to you any man that's sellin em's got to larn to do a sight of lyin but as woolly billy here wants it so bad i'll take a copy if tain't too dear all the same it's only fair to warn you that you'll not do much business in brine's rip for there was a book agent here last year as got about half the folks in the village to sign a crooked contract and we was all stung bad i'd advise you to move on and not really tackle brine's rip for another year or so now what's the price the stranger's face had fallen during this speech but it brightened at the concluding question six dollars four dollars and two dollars and a half according to style of bindin he answered bringing out a handful of leaflets and order forms and passing them round briskly and you don't need to pay more'n fifty cents down and sign this order and you pay the balance in a month's time when the books are delivered i'll give you my receipt for the fifty cents and you just fill in this order according to the bindin you choose let me advise you as a friend to take the six dollar one it's the best value thanks just the same said blackstock dryly pulling out his wallet but i guess woolly billy's just as soon have the two fifty one and i'll pay you the cash right now no signin orders for me here's my name and address right you are agreed the stranger cordially pocketing the money and signing the receipt cash payments for me every time if i could have my way now if some of you other gentlemen will follow mr blackstock's fine example you'll never regret it and neither will i come on woolly billy come on jim said blackstock stepping out into the street with the child and the dog at his heels we'll be gettin along home and leave this gentleman to argy with the boys two jake sanderson with the pay for the mill hands did not arrive that night nor yet the following morning 
along toward noon however there arrived a breathless stripling white-faced and wild-eyed with news of him the boy was young stevens son of andy stevens the game warden he and his father coming up from cribb's ridge had found the body of sanderson lying half in a pool beside the road covered with blood near at hand lay the bag empty slashed open with a bloody knife stevens had sent his boy on into the settlement for help while he himself had remained by the body guarding it lest some possible clue should be interfered with swift as a grass fire the shocking news spread through the village an excited crowd gathered in front of the store every one talking at once trying to question young stevens the sheriff was away down at fredericton for a holiday from his arduous duties but nobody lamented his absence it was his deputy they all turned to in such an emergency where's tug blackstock demanded half a dozen awed voices and as if in answer the tall lean figure of the deputy sheriff of nipsiwaska county came striding in haste up the sawdusty road with the big black dog crowding eagerly upon his heels the clamour of the crowd was hushed as blackstock put a few questions terse and pertinent to the excited boy the people of nipsiwaska county in general had the profoundest confidence in their deputy sheriff they believed that his shrewd brain and keen eye could find a clue to the most baffling of mysteries just now however his face was like a mask of marble and his eyes sunk back into his head were like points of steel the murdered man had been one of his best friends a comrade and helper in many a hard enterprise come said he to the lad we'll go and see and he started off down the road at that long loose stride of his which was swifter than a trot and much less tiring hold on a minute tug drawled a rasping nasal voice what is it hawker demanded blackstock turning impatiently on his heel you ain't asked nothing yet about the book agent mr biles him as sold your mother home in heaven maybe he could give us some information he said as how he'd had some talk with poor old jake blackstock's lips curled slightly he had not read the voluble stranger as a likely highwayman in any circumstances still less as one to try issues with a man like jake sanderson but the crowd eager to give tongue on any kind of assent and instinctively hostile to a book agent seized greedily upon the suggestion where is he send for him did anybody see him this morning Rot him out fetch him along the babble of voices started afresh he's cleared out cried a woman's shrill voice it was the voice of mrs stukeley who kept the boarding-house every one else was silent to hear what she had to say he quit my place just about daylight this morning continued the woman virulently she had not liked the stranger's black whiskers nor his ministerial garb nor his efforts to get a subscription out of her and she was therefore ready to believe him guilty without further proof he seemed in a powerful hurry to get away saying as how the archangel gabriel himself couldn't do business in this town seeing the effect her words produced and that even the usually imperturbable and disdainful deputy sheriff was impressed by them she could not refrain from embroidering her statement a little now as i come to think of it she went on i did notice as how he seemed kind of excited and nervous like so's he could hardly stop to finish his breakfast but he took time to make me knock half a dollar off his bill mac said blackstock sharply turning to red angus macdonald the village constable you take two of the boys and go after the book agent find him and fetch him back but no funny business with him mind you we ain't got a spark of evidence agin him we just want him as a witness mind the crowd's excitement was somewhat damped by this pronouncement and hawker's exasperating voice was heard to draw no evidence eh? if what ain't evidence him skinnin out that way afore sun-up i'd like to know what is but to this and similar comments tug blackstock paid no heed whatever he hurried on down the road toward the scene of the tragedy his lean jaws working grimly upon a huge chew of tobacco the big black dog not now at his heels but trotting a little way ahead and casting from one side of the road to the other nose to earth the crowd came on behind but blackstock waved them back i don't want none of you come within fifty paces of me afore i tell you to he announced with decision keep well back all of you or you'll mess up the tracks but this proved a decree too hard to be enforced for any length of time 
when he arrived at the place where the game warden kept watch beside the murdered man blackstock stood for a few moments in silence looking down upon the body of his friend with stony face and brooding eyes in spite of his grief his practised observation took in the whole scene to the minutest detail and photographed it upon his memory for reference the body lay with face and shoulder and one leg and arm in a deep stagnant pool by the roadside the head was covered with black clotted blood from a knife wound in the neck close by in the middle of the road lay a stout leather satchel gaping open and quite empty two small memorandum books one shut and the other with white leaves fluttering lay near the bag though the roadway at this point was dry and hard it bore some signs of a struggle and toward the edge of the water there were several little dark caked lumps of puddled dust blackstock first examined the road minutely all about the body but the examination even to such a practised eye as his yielded little result the ground was too hard and dusty to receive any legible trail and moreover it had been carelessly overtrodden by the game warden and his son but whether he found anything of interest or not blackstock's grim impassive face gave no sign at length he went over to the body and lifted it gently the coat and shirt were soaked with blood and showed marks of a fierce struggle blackstock opened the shirt and found the fatal wound a knife thrust which had been driven upwards between the ribs he laid the body down again and at the same time picked up a piece of paper crumpled and blood-stained which had lain beneath it he spread it open and for a moment his brows contracted as if in surprise and doubt it was one of the order forms for mother home and heaven he folded it up and put it carefully between the leaves of the notebook which he always carried in his pocket stevens who was close beside him had caught a glimpse of the paper and recognized it say he exclaimed under his breath i never thought of him but blackstock only shook his head slowly and called the big black dog which had been waiting all this time in an attitude of keen expectancy with mouth open and tail gently wagging take a good look at him jim said blackstock the dog sniffed the body all over and then looked up at his master as if for further directions and now take a sniff of this and he pointed to the rifled bag what do you make of it he inquired when the dog had smelt it all over minutely jim stood motionless with ears and tail drooping the picture of irresolution and bewilderment blackstock took out again the paper which he had just put away and offered it to the dog who nosed it carefully then looked at the dead body beside the pool and growled softly seek him jim said blackstock at once the dog ran up again to the body and back to the open book then he fell to circling about the bag nose to earth seeking to pick up the elusive trail at this point the crowd from the village unable longer to restrain their eagerness surged forward led by hawker and closed in effectually obliterating all trails jim growled angrily showed his long white teeth and drew back beside the body as if to guard it blackstock stood watching his action with a brooding scrutiny what's that bit of paper you found under him tug demanded hawker vehemently none of your business sam replied the deputy putting the blood-stained paper back into his pocket i seen what it was shouted hawker to the rest of the crowd is one of them there documents that the book agent had up to the store i always said as how twas him we'll catch him we'll string him up yelled the crowd starting back along the road at a run don't be such fools shouted blackstock hold on come back i tell you but he might as well have shouted to a flock of wild geese on their clamorous voyage through the sky fired by sam hawker's exhortations they were ready to lynch the black-whiskered stranger on sight blackstock cursed them in a cold fury i'll have to go after them andy said he or there'll be trouble when they find that there book agent better give em their head tug protested the warden guess he done it all right he'll get no more ends good for him maybe he did it and then again maybe he didn't retorted the deputy and anyways they're just plain loony now you'll stay here and i'll follow him up send bob back to the ridge to fetch the coroner he turned and started on the run in pursuit of the shouting crowd 
whistling at the same time for the dog to follow him but to his surprise jim did not obey instantly he was very busy digging under a big whitish stone at the other side of the pool blackstock halted jim he commanded angrily get out of that what do you mean by fooling about with woodchucks at a time like this come here jim lifted his head his muzzle and paws loaded with fresh earth and gazed at his master for a moment then with evident reluctance he obeyed but he kept looking back over his shoulder at the big white stone as if he hated to leave it there's a lot of ordinary pup left in that there dog yet exclaimed blackstock apologetically to the game warden there ain't a dog ever lived that wouldn't want to dig out a woodchuck answered stevens three the black-whiskered stranger had been overtaken by his pursuers about ten miles beyond brine's rip sleeping away the heat of the day under a spreading birch tree a few paces off the road he was sleeping soundly a too soundly indeed as thought the experienced constable for a man with murder on his soul but when he was roughly aroused and seized he seemed so terrified that his captors were all the more convinced of his guilt he made no resistance as he was being hurried along the road only clinging firmly to his black leather case and glancing with wild eyes from side to side as if nerving himself to a desperate dash for liberty when he had gathered however a notion of what he was wanted for to the astonishment of his captors his terror seemed to subside a fact which the constable noted narrowly he steadied his voice enough to ask several questions about the murder questions to which reply was curtly refused then he walked on in a stolid silence the ruddy colour gradually returning to his face a couple of miles before reaching brine's rip the second search party came in sight the deputy sheriff at the head of it and the shaggy black form of jim close at his heels with a savage curse hawker sprang forward and about half the party with him as if to snatch the prisoner from his captors and take instant vengeance upon him but blackstock was too quick for them the swiftest sprinter in the county he got to the other party ahead of the mob and whipped around to face them with one hand on the big revolver at his hip and jim showing his teeth beside him the constable and his party hugely astonished but confident that blackstock's side was the right one to be on closed protectingly around the prisoner whose eyes now almost bulged from his head you keep right back boys commanded the deputy in a voice of steel the law will look after this here prisoner if he's the guilty one fur as we can see that no if about it shouted hawker almost frothing at the mouth that's the man as done it and we're going to string him up for it right now for fear he might get off somewhere between the judges and the lawyers you keep out of it now tug about half the crowd surged forward with hawker in front up came blackstock's gun you know me boys said he keep back they kept back they all fell back indeed some paces except hawker who held his ground half crouching his lips distorted in a snarl of rage ah oh, now quit it sam urged one of the followers tan worth it and tugged right anyways the law's good enough with tug to the back of it and putting forth a long arm he dragged hawker back into the crowd put away your gun tug expostulated another seeing you feel that way about it we don't interfere blackstock stuck the revolver back into his belt with a grin glad you've come back to your senses boys said he perceiving that the crisis was over but keep an eye on hawker for a bit yet seems to have gone clean off his head don't fret tug we'll look after him agreed several of his comrades from the mill laying firmly persuasive hands upon the excited man who cursed them for cowards till they began to chaff him roughly what's making you so sore sam demanded one did the book agent try to make up to sis hopkins no it's tug that sis is making eyes at now suggested another that's what puttin sam so off is not leave the lady's name out of it boys interrupted blackstock in a tone that carried conviction quit that jaw now sam interposed another changing the subject and tell us what you've done with that fancy belt o' yourn and you're so proud of we ain't never seen you without it before that's so chimed in the constable that accounts for his foolishness them ain't himself without that fancy belt 
hawker stopped his cursing and pulled himself together with an effort as if only now realizing that his followers had gone over completely to the side of the law and tug blackstock busted the buckle he exclaimed quickly mend it when i get time now boys said blackstock presently we'll get right back along to where poor jake's still layin and there we'll ask this here stranger what he knows about it it's there if anywheres where we're most likely to get some light on the subject i've sent over to the ridge for the coroner and poor jake can't be moved till he comes the book agent his confidence apparently restored by the attitude of blackstock now let loose a torrent of eloquence to explain how glad he would be to tell all he knew and how sorry he was that he knew nothing having merely had a brief conversation with poor mr sanderson on the morning of the previous day you'll have lots of time to tell us all that when we're asking you answered blackstock now take my advice and keep your mouth shut as blackstock was speaking jim slipped in alongside the prisoner and rubbed against him with a friendly wag of the tail as if to say i'm sorry to see you in such a hole old chap some of the men laughed and one who was more or less a friend of hawker's remarked sarcastically jim don't seem quite so discriminating as usual tug oh i don't know replied the deputy dryly noting the dog's attitude with evident interest time will show you must remember a man ain't necessarily a murderer just because he wears black side lights and tries to sell you a book that ain't no good no good burst out the prisoner reddening with indignation you show me another book that's half as good at double the price and i'll give you shut up you ordered the deputy with a curious look this ain't no picnic you're on remember then some one as if for the first time thought of the money for which sanderson had been murdered why don't you search him tug he demanded let's have a look in that there black knapsack you bloomin fool shouted hawker again growing excited you don't suppose he'd be carrying it on him do you he'd have it buried somewhere in the woods where he could get it later right you are sam agreed the deputy the man has done the deed ain't likely to carry the evidence around on him but all the same we'll search the prisoner by and by by the time the strange procession had got back to the scene of the tragedy it had been swelled by half the population of the village at blackstock's request zeb smith the proprietor of the store who was also a magistrate swore in a score of special constables to keep back the crowd while awaiting the arrival of the coroner under the magistrate's orders which satisfied blackstock's demand for strict formality of procedure the prisoner was searched and could not refrain from showing a childish triumph when nothing was found upon him passing from abject terror to a ridiculous overconfidence he with difficulty restrained himself from seizing the opportunity to harangue the crowd on the merits of a mother home and heaven his face was wreathed in fatuous smiles as he saw the precious book snatched from its case and passed around mockingly from hand to hand he certainly did not look like a murderer and several of the crowd including stevens the game warden began to wonder if they had not been barking up the wrong tree i've got the idee remarked stevens it'd take a baker's dozen of that chap to do in jake sanderson that way the skate as killed jake was some man anyways i like to know sneered hawker how you're going to account for that piece of paper the book agent's paper at tugwell found there under the body ah oh, shucks answered the game warden that's easy he's been a sewin em around the country so's anybody could get a hold of em same's you or me sam this harmless if ill-timed pleasantry appeared to hawker in his excitement a wanton insult his lean face went black as thunder and his lips worked with some savage retort that would not come out but at that instant came a strange diversion the dog jim who under blackstock's direction had been sniffing long and minutely at the clothes of the murdered man at the rifled leather bag and at the ground all about came suddenly up to hawker and stood staring at him with a deep menacing growl while the thick hair rose stiffly along his back for a moment there was dead silence save for that strange accusing growl hawker's face went white to the lips then in a blaze of fury he yelled get out of that i'll teach you to come showing your teeth at me and he launched a savage kick at the animal jim 
come here rapped out the command of tug blackstock sharp as a rifle shot and jim who had eluded the kick trotted back still growling to his master whatever you been doin' to jim sam demanded one of the mill hands i ain't never seen him act like that afore he's always had a grudge agin me panted hawker cause i had to give him a lickin once now you're lyin sam hawker said blackstock quietly you know right well as how you and jim were good friends only yesterday at the store where i saw you feedin him and i don't think likely you've ever given jim a lickin it don't sound probable seems to me there's a lot of us has gone a bit off their nut over this thing and not much wonder neither commented the game warden looks like sam hawker has gone plum crazy and now there's jim the sensiblest dog in the world with lots more brains than most men folk foolin away his time like a year old pup a tryin to dig out a darn old woodchuck hole such in fact seemed to be jim's object he was digging furiously with both forepaws beneath the big white stone on the opposite side of the pool he's bit me i'll kill him screamed hawker his face distorted and foam at the corners of his lips he plucked his hunting knife from its sheath and leapt forward wildly with the evident intention of darting around the pool and knifing the dog but blackstock who had been watching him intently was too quick for him no you don't sam he snapped catching him by the wrist with such a wrench that the bright blade fell to the ground with a scream hawker struck at his face but blackstock parried the blow tripped him neatly and fell on him hold him fast boys he ordered seems like he's gone mad don't let him hurt himself in five seconds the raving man was trussed up helpless as a chicken his hands tied behind his back his legs lashed together at the knees so that he could neither run nor kick then he was lifted to his feet and held thus inexorably but with commiseration sorry to be rough with you sam said one of the constables but you gone crazy as a bedbug never knowed sam was such a friend of jake's muttered another with deepest sympathy but blackstock stood close beside the body of the murdered man and watched with a face of granite the efforts of jim to dig under the big white stone his absorption in such an apparently frivolous matter attracted the notice of the crowd a hush fell upon them all broken only by the hoarse half-smothered ravings of sam hawker tain't no woodchuck jim's diggin for you see muttered one of the constables to the puzzled stevens tug don't seem to think so neither agreed stevens angus said blackstock in a low strained voice to the constable who had just spoken would you mind stepping around and givin jim a lift with that there stone the constable hastened to obey as he approached jim looked up his face covered thickly with earth wagged his tail in greeting then fell to work again with redoubled energy the constable set both hands under the stone and with a huge heave turned it over with a yelp of delight jim plunged his head into the hole grabbed something in his mouth and tore around the pool with it the something was long and whitish and trailed as he ran he laid it at blackstock's feet blackstock held it up so that all might see it it was a painted indian belt and it was stained and smeared with blood the constable picked out of the hole a package of bills for some moments no one spoke and even the ravings of hawker were stilled then tug blackstock spoke while every one as if with one consent turned his eyes away from the face of sam hawker unwilling to see a comrade's shame and horror this is a matter now for judge and jury boys said he in a voice that was grave and stern but i think you'll all agree that we ain't no call to detain this gentleman who's been put to so much inconvenience all on account of our little mistake don't mention it don't mention it protested the book agent as his guards with profuse apologies released him that's a mighty intelligent dog of yours mr blackstock he sure done you a good turn this day mister replied the deputy grimly end of story one part two story one of jim the story of a backwoods police dog and other stories by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain story one part three the hole in the tree 
one it was woolly billy who discovered the pile notes and silver with a few stray gold pieces so snugly hidden under the fish hawk's nest the fish hawk's nest was in the crotch of the old half-dead rock maple on the shore of the desolate little lake which lay basking in the flatlands about a mile back behind brine's rip mills as the fish hawk is one of the most estimable of all the wilderness folk both brave and inoffensive troubling no one except the fat and lazy fish that swarmed in the lake below and as he is protected by a superstition of the backwoodsmen who say it brings ill luck to disturb the domestic arrangements of a fish hawk the big nest conspicuous for miles about was never disturbed by even the most amiable curiosity but woolly billy not fully acclimatized to the backwoods tradition and superstition and uninformed as to the firmness and decision with which the fish hawks are apt to resent any intrusion had long hankered to explore the mysteries of that great nest one morning he made up his mind to try it tug blackstock deputy sheriff of nipsiwaska county was away for a day or two and old mrs amos his housekeeper was too deaf and rheumatic to fuss herself greatly about the goings-on of so fantastic a child as woolly billy so long as she knew he had jim to look after him this serves to explain how a small boy like woolly billy his seven years and nine months resting lightly on his amazingly fluffy shock of pale flaxen curls could be trotting off down the lonely backwoods trail with no companion or guardian but a big black dog woolly billy was familiar with the mossy old trail to the lake and did not linger upon it reaching the shore he wasted no time throwing sticks in for jim to retrieve but in spite of the dog's eager invitations to this pastime made his way along the dry edge between undergrowth and water till he came to the bluff pushing laboriously through the hot aromatic scented tangle of bushes he climbed to the foot of the old maple which looked dwarfed by the burden of the huge nest carried in its crotch woolly billy was an expert tree climber but this great trunk presented new problems twice he went round it finding no likely spot to begin then certain roughnesses tempted him and he succeeded in drawing himself up several feet serene in the consciousness of his good intentions he struggled on he gained perhaps another foot then he stuck he pulled hard upon a ragged edge of bark trying to work his way further around the trunk a patch of bark came away suddenly in his grip and he fell backwards with a startled cry he fell plump on jim rolled off into the bushes picked himself up shook the hair out of his eyes and stood staring up at a round hole in the trunk where the patch of bark had been a hole in a tree is always interesting it suggests such possibilities forgetting his scratches woolly billy made haste to climb up again in spite of jim's protest he peered eagerly into the hole but he could see nothing and he was cautious for one could never tell what lived in a hole like that or what the occupant if there happened to be any might have to say to an intruder he would not venture his hand into the unknown he slipped down got a bit of stick and thrust that into the hole there was no result but he learnt that the hole was shallow he stirred the stick about there came a slight jingling sound in return woolly billy withdrew the stick and thought for a moment he reasoned that a thing that jingled was not at all likely to bite he dropped the stick and cautiously inserted his hand to the full length of his little arm his fingers grasped something that felt more or less familiar and he drew forth a banknote and several silver coins woolly billy's eyes grew very round and large as he stared at his handful he was sure that money did not grow in hollow trees tug blackstock kept his money in an old black wallet woolly billy liked money because it bought peppermints and molasses candy and ginger pop but this money was plainly not his he reluctantly put it back into the hole thoughtfully he climbed down he knew that money was such a desirable thing that it led some people bad people whom tug blackstock hated to steal what did not belong to them 
he picked up the patch of bark and laboriously fitted it back into place over the hole lest some of these bad people should find the money and appropriate it not a word now not a single word he admonished jim till tug comes home we'll tell him all about it two it was five o'clock in the sleepy summer afternoon and the flies buzzed drowsily among the miscellaneous articles that graced the windows of the corner store the mills had shut down early because the supply of logs was running low in the boom and no more could be expected until there should be a rise of water some half dozen of the mill hands were sitting about the store on nail kegs and soap boxes while zeb smith the proprietor swung his long legs lazily from the edge of the littered counter woolly billy came in with a piece of silver in his little fist to buy a packet of tea for mrs amos jim not liking the smoke stayed outside on the plank sidewalk and snapped at flies the child who was regarded as the mascot of brine's rip mills was greeted with a fire of solemn chaff which he received with an impartial urbanity oh, quick coddlin the kitty and don't try to be so smart growled long jackson the magadavi river man lifting his gaunt length from a pile of axe handles and thrusting his fist deep into his trousers pocket here zeb give me a box of peppermints for woolly billy he ain't been in to see us this long while he pulled out a handful of coins and dollar bills and proceeded to select a silver bit from the collection the sight was too much for woolly billy bursting with his secret i know where there's lots more money than that he blurted out proudly in a hole in a tree during the past twelve months or more there had been thefts of money usually of petty sums in brine's rip mills and the neighbourhood and all tug blackstock's detective skill had failed to gain the faintest clue to the perpetrator suspicions there had been but all had vanished into thin air at the touch of investigation woolly billy's amazing statement therefore was like a little bombshell in the shop every one of his audience stiffened up with intense interest one swarthy keen-featured slim-waisted half indian looking fellow with the shapely hands and feet that mark so many of the indian mixed bloods was sitting on a bale of homespun behind long jackson and smoking solemnly with half-closed lids his eyes opened wide for a fraction of a second and darted one searching glance at the child's face then he dropped his lids slowly once more till the eyes were all but closed the others all stared eagerly at woolly billy pleased with the interest he had excited woolly billy glanced about him and shook back his mop of pale curls self-consciously lots more he repeated big handfuls then he remembered his discretion his resolve to tell no one but tug blackstock about his discovery seeking to change the subject he beamed upon long jackson thank you long he said politely i love peppermints and jim loves em too where did you say that hole in the tree was asked long jackson reaching for the box that held the peppermints and ostentatiously filling a generous paper bag woolly billy looked apologetic and deprecating please long if you don't mind very much i can't tell anybody but tug blackstock that jackson laid the bag of peppermints a little to one side as if to convey that their transfer was contingent upon woolly billy's behaviour the child looked wistfully at the coveted sweets then his red lips compressed themselves with decision and resentment i won't tell anybody but tug blackstock of course said he and i don't want any peppermints thank you long he picked up his package of tea and turned to leave the shop angry at himself for having spoken of the secret and angry at jackson for trying to get ahead of tug blackstock jackson looked annoyed at the rebuff extended his leg and closed the door woolly billy's blue eyes blazed one of the other men strove to propitiate him oh come on woolly billy he urged coaxingly don't get riled at long you and him's pals you know we're all pals o yourn and a tug's and there ain't no harm at all at all in your showin us this here treasure that you've lit on to besides you know there's likely some of that's their treasure belongs to us uns here 
come on now and take us to your hole in the tree you ain't a goin to get out of this here store willy billy i tell you that till you promise to take us to it right off said long jackson sharply woolly billy was not alarmed in the least by this threat but he was so furious that for a moment he could not speak he could do nothing but stand glaring up at long jackson with such fiery defiance that the good-natured mill-hand almost relented but it chanced that he was one of the sufferers and he was in a hurry to get his money back at this point the swarthy woodsman on the bale of homespun opened his narrow eyes once again took the pipe from his mouth and spoke up wet plague and that kid long he drawled the cash'll be all there when tug blackstock gets back and it'll save a lot of trouble and misunderstandin having him to see to dividin it up fair and square let woolly billy out long jackson shook his head obstinately and opened his mouth to reply but at this moment woolly billy found his voice let me out let me out let me out he screamed shrilly stamping his feet and clenching his little fist instantly a heavy body was hurled upon the outside of the door striving to break it in zeb smith swung his long legs down from the counter hurriedly the kid's right and black dan's right open the door long and do it quick i don't want that there dog comin through the winder and he'll be a-doin it too in half a jiff get along then woolly if you insist on it but no more peppermints mind growled jackson throwing open the door and stepping back discreetly as he did so jim came in with a rush just saving himself from knocking woolly billy over one swift glance assured him that the child was all right but very angry about something it's all right jim come with me said woolly billy tugging at the animal's collar and the pair stalked away haughtily side by side three tug blackstock arrived the next morning about eleven before he had time to sit down for a cup of that strenuous black tea which the woodsmen consume at all hours he had heard from woolly billy's eager lips the story of the hole in the tree beneath the fish hawk's nest he heard also of the episode at zeb smith's door but woolly billy by this time had quite forgiven long jackson so the incident was told in such a way that blackstock had no reason to take offence long tried hard said the child to get me to tell where that hole was but i wouldn't and black dan was awful nice and made him stop bothering me and said i was quite right not to tell anybody till you came home cause you'd know what to do hm said the deputy sheriff thoughtfully long's had a lot of money stole from him so of course he wanted to get his eye onto that hole quick but tain't like black dan to be that thoughtful maybe he hasn't had none taken while he was speaking a bunch of the mill hands arrived at the door word of blackstock's return having gone through the village we want to go and help you find that treasure tug said long jackson glancing somewhat sheepishly at woolly billy a friendly grin from the child reassured him and he went on with more confidence we tried to get the kitty to tell us where twas but wild steers wouldn't drag it out of him till you got back that's right long agreed blackstock but it don't need to be no expedition we don't want the whole village traipsin after us you and three or four more of the boys that's lost money come along with woolly billy and me and the rest of you meet us at the store in about a couple of hours time tell any other folks you see that i don't want em follerin after us because it may mix up things and anyways i don't want it see after a few moments hesitation and consultation the majority of the mill hands turned away leaving long jackson and big andy stevens the blue-eyed giant from the oromtoko who had been one of the chief victims and macdonald and black sanders and black dan whose name had been dan black till the whim of the woodsman turned it about blackstock eyed them appraisingly i didn't know as you'd been one of the victims too dan he remarked didn't you tug returned black with a short laugh well i didn't say nothin about it cause i was after doin a leetle detective work on me own and maybe i'll have got it in ahead of you if woolly billy here hadn't a been so smart but i tell you tug if that there treasure's the lot we're thinkin it is there ought to be a five-dollar bill in it what i've marked 
hm grunted the deputy hastily gulping down the last of his tea and rising to his feet but woolly billy and me and jim's a combination pretty hard to get ahead of i'm thinkin as the party neared the bluff whereon the tree of the fishhawk's nest stood ragged against the sky the air grew rank with the pungent odor of skunk now skunks were too common in the region of brine's rip mills for that smell as a rule to excite any more comment than an occasional disgusted execration when it became too concentrated but to-day it drew more than passing attention macdonald sniffed intently it's deuced queer said he but i've noticed there's always been a smell of skunk round when anybody's lost anything did it ever strike you that way tug yes some assented the deputy curtly it's a skunk all right that's been taking our money said big andy and if he don't carry his tail over his back every one of the party was sniffing the tainted air as if the familiar stench were some rare perfume all but jim he had had an encounter with a skunk once in his impulsive puppy days and the memory was too painful to be dwelt upon as they climbed the slope one of the fish hawks came swooping down from somewhere high in the blue and began circling on slow wings about the nest that cross old bird doesn't like visitors remarked woolly billy you wouldn't neither woolly billy if you was a fish hawk said jackson arrived at the tree woolly billy pointed eagerly to a slightly broken piece of bark a little above the height of the deputy's head there's the hole he cried clapping his hands in his excitement as if relieved to find it had not vanished keep off a bit now boys cautioned blackstock drawing his long hunting knife he carefully loosened the bark without letting his hand come in contact with it and on the point of the knife laid it aside against the foot of the trunk don't any of you touch it he admonished then he slipped his hand into the hole and felt about a look of chagrin came over his face and he withdrew his hand empty nothing there said he it was there yesterday morning protested woolly billy his blue eyes filling with tears yes yes of course agreed blackstock glancing slowly around the circle of disappointed faces somebody from the store's been blabbing exclaimed black dan in a loud and angry voice and why not protested big andy with a guilty air we never said nothin about keepin it a secret in spite of their disappointment the mill hands laughed big andy was not one to keep a secret in any case and his weakness for a certain pretty widow who kept the post office was common comment big andy responded by blushing to the roots of his blond hair jim commanded the deputy and the big black dog bounded up to him his eyes bright with expectation the deputy picked him up and held him aloft with his muzzle to the edge of the hole smell that he ordered and jim sniffed intently then he set him down and directed him to the piece of bark that too jim's nose investigated minutely his feathered tail slowly wagging seek him ordered blackstock jim whined looked puzzled and sniffed again at the bark the information which his subtle nose picked up there was extremely confusing first there was the smell of skunk but that smell of skunk was everywhere dulling the keenness of his discrimination then there was a faint faint reminiscence of woolly billy but there was woolly billy at tug blackstock's side certainly there could be no reason for him to seek woolly billy then there was an elusive tangled scent which for some moments defied him at last however he got a clue to it with a pleased bark his way of saying eureka he whipped about trotted over to big andy Stevens, sat down in front of him and gazed up at him with tongue hanging out and an air of friendly inquiry as much as to say here i am andy but i don't know what tug blackstock wants me to seek you for seeing as you're right here alongside him big andy dropped his hand on the dog's head familiarly then noticing the sudden tense silence of the party his eyes grew very big and round what are you all staring at me for boys he demanded with a sort of uneasy wonder ax jim responded black dan harshly i reckon old jim's making a mistake for once tug drawled long jackson who was andy's special pal 
the deputy rubbed his lean chin reflectively there could be no one more above suspicion in his eyes than this transparently honest young giant from the orem toco but jim's curious action had scattered to the winds at least for a moment a sort of hypothesis which he had been building up in his mind at the same time he felt dimly that a new clue was being held out to him if he could only grasp it he wanted time to think we can all make mistakes he announced sententiously come here jim seek him boy seek him and he waved his hand at large jim bounced off with a joyous yelp and began quartering the ground hither and thither all about the tree big andy at a complete loss for words stood staring from one to another with eyes of indignant and incredulous reproach suddenly a yelp of triumph was heard in the bushes a little way down towards the lake and jim came racing back with a dark magenta article in his mouth at the foot of the tree he stopped and looked at blackstock interrogatively receiving no sign whatever from his master whose face had lit up for an instant but was now as impassive as a hitching post he stared at black dan for a few seconds and then let his eyes wander back to andy's face in the midst of his obvious hesitation the oromoco man stepped forward durned if that ain't one of my old mittens he exclaimed eagerly what's this knit for me i've been lookin for em everywhere bring it here jim as the dog trotted up with it obediently the deputy intervened and stopped him you shall have it by and by andy said he if it's yourn but just now i don't want nobody to touch except jim if you acknowledge it's yourn why well, of course it's mine interrupted andy resentfully and i want to find the other one so do i said blackstock drop it jim go find the other mitt as jim went ranging once more through the bushes the whole party moved around to the other side of the tree to get out of the downpour of the noon sun as they passed the magenta mitten black dan picked it up and examined it ostentatiously how do you know it's yourn andy he demanded there's lots of magenta mitts in the world i reckon tug blackstock turned upon him i said i didn't want no one to touch that mitt he snapped oh uh, beg pardon tug said dan dropping the mitt i forgot s'pose it's some kind of confusing jim scent getting another smell beside andy's on to it it might replied the deputy coolly and then again it mightn't for a little while every one was quiet listening to jim as he crashed about through the bushes and confidently but unreasonably expecting him to reappear with the other mitten or at least that was what big andy and woolly billy expected the deputy at least did not at last he spoke i agree with mac here boys said he that there may be something more'n skunk in this skunk smell we'll just look into it a bit you all keep back a ways and you long just keep an eye on woolly billy if you don't mind while i go on with jim he whistled to the dog and directed his attention to a spot at the foot of the tree exactly beneath the hole jim sniffed hard at the spot then looked up at his master with tail drooping despondently yes i know it skunk plain skunk agreed the deputy but i want him seek him jim seek him boy thus reassured jim's tail went up again he started off through the bushes down towards the lake with his master close behind him the rest of the party followed thirty paces or so behind the trail led straight down to the lake's edge here jim stopped short that skunk's a kind of water baby remarked long jackson oh do you think so queried woolly billy much interested of course answered jackson don't you see he's took to the water now your common no-account skunk hates wetten his fur like pison the deputy examined the hard white sand at the water's edge it showed faint traces of moccasined feet he pursed his lips it was an old game but a good one this breaking a trail by going into the water he had no way of deciding whether his quarry had turned up the lake shore or down towards the outlet he guessed at the latter as the more likely alternative jim trotted slowly ahead sniffing every foot of ground along the water's edge as they approached the outlet the shore became muddy and jackson swung woolly billy up on to his shoulder once in the outlet the foreshore narrowed to a tiny strip of bare rock between the water and an almost perpendicular bank covered with shrubs and vines 
all at once the smell of skunk which had been almost left behind returned upon the air with fresh pungency blackstock stopped short and scanned the bank with narrowed eyes a second or two later jim yelped his signal and his tail went up he sniffed eagerly across the ribbon of rock and then leapt at the face of the bank the deputy called him off and hurried to the spot the rest of the party much excited closed up to within four or five paces when a wave of the deputy's hand checked them phew ejaculated black dan holding his nose there's a skunk hole in that there bank you'll be getting something in the eye tug if you don't keep off blackstock who was busy pulling apart the curtain of vines paid no attention but long jackson answered sarcastically you call yourself a woodsman dan said he and you don't know that the hole where a skunk lives don't smell any your real skunks are quite a gentleman and keeps his home always clean and tidy tug blackstock ain't a goin to get nothin in the eye well i reckon we'd better smoke said black dan amiably pulling out his pipe and filling it and the others followed his example blackstock thrust his hand in a shallow hole in the bank quite hidden by the foliage he drew out a pair of moccasins water soaked and hurriedly set them down on the rock for all their soaking they reeked of skunk he picked up one on the point of a stick and examined it minutely in spite of all the soaking the soul to his initiated eye still bore traces of that viscous oily liquid which no water will wash off the strangling exudation of the skunk's defensive gland it was just what he had expected the moccasin was neat and slim and of medium size not more than seven at most he held it up that all might see it clearly does this belong to you andy stevens he asked there was a jeer from the group and big andy held up an enormous foot which might by courtesy have been numbered a thirteen it was a point upon which the oromocto man was usually sensitive but to-day he was proud of it you'll have to play cinderella tug and find out what little foot it fits on to suggested macdonald the deputy fished again in the hole he drew forth a magenta mitten dropped it promptly then held it up on the point of his stick at arm's length it had been with the moccasins big andy stepped forward to claim it then checked himself the mite too strong for me now he protested i'll have to get sis to knit me another pair i guess blackstock dropped the offensive thing beside the moccasins at his feet and reached once more into the hole ain't taken no risks this time boy said blackstock he's took the swag with him there was a growl of disappointment long jackson could not refrain from a reproachful glance at woolly billy but refrained from saying the obvious what are you gonna do about it tug demanded black dan have you any kind of a real clue do you think now wait and see was blackstock's noncommittal reply he picked up the moccasins and mitten again on the point of his stick scanned the bank sharply to make sure his quarry had not gone that way and led the procession once more down along the rocky shore of the stream seek him he said again to jim and the dog as before trotted on ahead sniffing along by the water's edge to intercept the trail of whoever had stepped ashore the party emerged at length upon the bank of the main stream and turned upwards toward brine's rip after they had gone about half a mile they rounded a bend and came in sight of a violent rapid which cut close in shore at this point it would be obviously impossible for any one walking in the shallow water to avoid coming out upon dry ground tug blackstock quickened his pace and waved jim forward a sharp oath broke from black dan's lip i've been and gone and left my backy pouch behind by the skunk's hole he announced and grumbling under his breath he turned back down the shore blackstock ran on as if suddenly in a great hurry just where the shallow water ended at the foot of the rapid jim gave his signal with voice and tail he raced up the bank to a clump of bushes and began thrashing about in them what do you suppose he's found there asked big andy scent and lots of it no mistake this time announced macdonald ain't you caught on to jim's signs yet jim said the deputy sharply but not loud fetch him jim with nose in air instead of to the ground set off at a gallop down the shore in the direction of the outlet 
the deputy turned about dan he shouted peremptorily come back here i want you instead of obeying black dan dashed up the bank running like a deer and vanished into the bushes i knew it that's the skunk boys go home you billy cried blackstock and started after the fugitive the rest followed close at his heels but jackson cried you better call off jim quick dan's got a gun on him the deputy gave a shrill whistle and jim who was just vanishing into the bush stopped short at the same instant a shot rang out from the bushes and the dog dropped in his tracks with a howl of anguish blackstock's lean jaws set themselves like iron he whipped out his own heavy colt and the party tore on till they met jim dragging himself towards them with a wounded hind leg trailing pitifully the deputy gave one look at the big black dog heaved a breath of relief and stopped tain't no manner o use chasin him now boys he decreed because as we all know dan can run right away from the best runner amongst us but now i know him and i'm suspicioned him this two months only i couldn't get no clue i'll get him and never you fear just now you'd better help me carry jim home so's we can get him doctored up and in good shape i reckon nipsiwaska county can't afford to lose mr assistant deputy sheriff that there skunk oil on dan's moccasin fooled both jim and me good and plenty didn't it but whatever did he want of my mitts demanded big andy now ye air a saphead andy stevens growled macdonald if ye can't see that end of story one part three